Hello everyone and welcome back. Let's go ahead and talk about the urinary system. So if you look at the chapter objectives here, it probably seems like quite a lot of stuff for us to cover here, but I think you'll agree after it's all said and done that it really wasn't as bad as maybe it seems just from looking at this. And you're going to see that all the different bullet points on here are going to kind of be unified together towards the end. So let's go ahead and hop right into it. So you will remember that one of the consistent themes that we've touched on throughout the semester, both in chapter 3 and chapter 20, and maybe in a couple of other places, is how important it is to regulate both the content and volume of your extracellular fluids. So extracellular fluids, we're talking about blood plasma and interstitial fluid. In chapter 3, we talked about the importance of osmolarity, and in chapter 20, we talked about the importance of blood volume and the uh, role that that plays in determining your blood pressure. So when either of these parameters, whether it's a volume issue or a content issue, become out of the norm, it's going to be the job of the urinary system, specifically the kidneys, to filter the plasma or interstitial fluid, remove the sorts of things that don't need to be there, and produce a filtrate called urine that contains, like I said, all that unwanted material such as excess water, excess uh, salts, waste products, things of that nature. And what gets left behind is going to be a blood plasma and interstitial fluid that has exactly the desired makeup, perfect osmolarity, and, and perfect uh, volume in terms of uh, the blood plasma. So several things that the kidneys are going to regulate for us, the volume of the blood plasma, so you'll remember how important that is as it regards to blood pressure, uh, the concentration of plasma waste products. We don't want these things to be too terribly high, so it's going to be uh, the job of the kidneys to uh, get some of those things into the urine away from the blood plasma so that we can excrete those things out. Uh, we want to regulate the concentrations of ions like sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, calcium, and things of that nature. And then another less appreciated thing is that we are helping to regulate the pH of the blood plasma itself. Now, back in chapter 22, we talked about the role the bicarbonate system plays in helping, helping to buffer the pH of the blood plasma, but that's not the only thing that's going to help keep your blood plasma at 7.4 uh, pH. So uh, essentially what the kidneys can do is to absorb excess hydrogen ions away from the blood plasma in cases in which it gets too acidic, and we'll talk about uh, that a little bit later on, but you obviously will remember how the pH of the blood plasma plays a role in determining how well hemoglobin binds to oxygen, which clearly is very important. So let's start with talking about the urine itself. So once all the uh, kind of functions that the kidney provides for us are done, and we'll get to those eventually, but once the kidney's role has pretty much been finished, we end up with this urine product. So the makeup of urine is not something that is necessarily standardized for a healthy person. So the makeup of your urine, even for a healthy person, can vary a lot depending on a number of factors, including things like how much water did you drink that day, what sorts of things have you been eating, how much have you been exercising, what's the temperature outside. There's lots of different things that can uh, play a role in determining what uh, the kind of numbers are for the uh, different parameters of your urine. So you can kind of look down this chart here. Uh, the color aspect is something that I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, the volume, uh, obviously how much urine you produce in a 24-hour period is going to be dependent on your uh, fluid intake. Uh, the pH of your urine is something that can fluctuate quite a bit. We typically expect it to be acidic, usually somewhere around a pH of 6 or so. But again, there's some uh, variation there. Uh, specific gravity, which is something that indirectly measures uh, uh, for something like dehydration. It basically measures of the urine that you've produced, to what extent is it made up of water, and basically uh, the specific gravity or density of the urine as a uh, uh, normalized to pure water. It's going to change depending on how much water or how little water is in the urine. Uh, a couple other things that we'll talk about, such as how much uh, uh, 
uh, heme breakdown products are in there. There shouldn't really be any cells at all in the urine, whether it's red blood cells or white blood cells, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then there are certain things other than cells that should not be there at all. So there should not be any blood in the cell, in the urine. There should not be any glucose in the urine. Certain things that you'll see where it says none here, like proteins and glucose and different types of cells, there should be none of that in the urine. And we will discuss that later when we talk about uh, the process of filtrate formation in the kidney nephron. So I'm sure you're aware based on personal experience that urine typically has a yellow color to it. Well, that yellow color is a product of a, a chemical called urochrome. This is a breakdown product of heme metabolism. So basically the idea is that when your red blood cells have gone through their entire 120 day life cycle, your body has to some way either recycle or dispose of some of the heme that was a part of your hemoglobin. Well, urochrome is one of the breakdown products and one of the ways that we expel uh, heme out of the body is through urination and urochrome is a way that we do that. And then like I was saying, you should definitely take note of the fact that certain things in this chart are not supposed to be in healthy urine. So it's going to be very telling via urinalysis if some of these things show up in a person's urine, it's going to be telling of a number of different problems. So just as a general rule, the color of urine can indicate your hydration level. So the idea here is pretty simple. The more hydrated you are, the greater percentage of the urine is going to be made up of water and the less the percentage will be made up of urochrome. So if you are very hydrated, your urine will be less of a yellow color and more of a kind of clear white color. Well, not white, but more of a clear kind of colorless color. There we go. Uh, so... The idea is that the kidneys are going to filter excess water out of the blood to help keep the blood volume constant. So the more water you drink, the more water is going to come out in your urine. So therefore, we can use the color of your urine as a rough indicator of your hydration level. The more dehydrated you are, the more yellow and darker the color of your urine is going to become as the urochrome becomes more and more concentrated in a smaller and smaller volume of water. Um, this is one of my favorite things to kind of show here. It's not really anything different than what uh, the OpenStax book shows, but uh, uh, this is a uh, urine color chart that is in uh, the locker room and facilities of the Texas Longhorns. And uh, you can kind of see the uh, emphasis they place on their athletes uh, maintaining what's called championship hydration levels. So you can kind of see uh, the shaming they do for some of their football players that uh, don't drink enough water or don't drink enough fluids. My favorite is uh, you are headed for Area 51. That's one of my favorite ones there. Okay, so a couple of other... Uh, urine parameters, essentially how much are you urinating per day, right? So uh, for normal people, uh, we're going to usually uh, urinate about one to two liters a day. So that's, pr that's pretty healthy. So obviously in terms of things not being healthy is either you urinate too much or you urinate not enough. So uh, polyuria, uh, in which case you're urinating way, way, way too much, Usually this is going to be a, a sign of some type of diabetes, whether it's uh, the diabetes most of us are familiar with, diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, which really doesn't have anything to do with glucose like mellitus does. It has more to do with uh, antidiuretic hormone, which we can talk about later. Uh, so normally when someone's urinating too much, the first thing you probably want to look for is some type of diabetes, but that's certainly not the only explanation for uh uh, polyuria. Obviously, drinking a whole lot of water would do that too, and that's that's not necess necessarily a problem. Uh, oliguria, which is a little bit less than ideal uh, 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 urine production in a day, most of the case this is going to be because of dehydration or maybe some sort of gastrointestinal issue in which you're losing a lot of water uh, through your bowels. Uh, and then there is a very severe case of the same sort of thing, anuria, in which case you're basically not urinating hardly at all. So kidney failure, very, very, very bad, uh, uh, very serious conditions. Uh, there's not really going to be any, uh, uh, what I'm looking for, there's not really going to be any uh, lighthearted explanations for someone having anuria. That's a very, very, very serious condition. Well, here's something that's going to surprise you. If a normal person urinates one to two liters a day, would it surprise you to know that your kidneys actually filter about 180 liters of blood a day? 
So that's a lot. That's about uh, 190 to 180 times more than you actually urinate in a day. So your kidneys are filtering about 180 liters per day. Do you happen to remember about how much blood is in your body altogether? Yeah, it's about, it's somewhere between five and six liters. So essentially, your blood is being filtered several times a day, somewhere between 20 and 30 times a day, it seems. So most of that 180 liters of urine that is getting filtered, most of that gets reabsorbed back into the blood. So it's not the sort of thing where everything out of your blood is getting sucked into your kidneys and then it's never coming back. What your kidneys essentially are doing is filtering the blood and then putting most everything back. If everything is healthy and the way it's supposed to be, a very small volume of your blood is actually going to make it into the urine. So even though we're filtering about 180 liters of blood a day, only one to two liters of that is actually going to be produced as urine. But it is worth mentioning, and you can see this is the case in anuria, even in cases of severe dehydration, even if you haven't had any water in several days, you have this thing called obligatory water loss, where even if you really, really, really do not need to urinate, even if you are very dehydrated, you've got to urinate a little bit just to rid your body of several harmful wastes, like urea and things of that nature. So in this picture, let's take a quick little peek at some of the anatomy of the urinary system. So this will be our first chapter in which we have gone below the level of the diaphragm. So the past few chapters, we've been in the thoracic cavity, which was the body cavity above the level of the diaphragm. So we were looking at the heart, we were looking at the lungs. So now we are venturing below the diaphragm and we are now in the abdominopelvic cavity. So you can see descending down from the thoracic cavity, you can see the inferior vena cava. So this is going to be returning deoxygenated blood from everything below the diaphragm back up and into the right atrium. You can see both of your kidneys here. Here's your right kidney, here's your left kidney. And then as we mentioned in our uh, uh, foray into uh, the endocrine system, we mentioned that each kidney has an adrenal gland resting on top. So obviously you'll want to be aware of that. We've talked about that before. Uh, you can see the aorta descending down there's your descending aorta, and you can notice that the aorta branches off into two renal arteries. This is what is bringing blood into the kidneys, blood that is to be filtered, to be treated. And then you'll see the descending aorta continues past the kidneys to service all the other organs and tissues below the kidneys that need oxygen and nutrients and things of that nature. Uh, let's see here. So the kidneys, you can see, have these hollow tubes called ureters. Once the urine has been produced, the urine will be transported down through these ureters on their way to the urinary bladder down here. The bladder contains a lot of muscle, namely smooth muscle, that can contract and pressurize the urine for expulsion out through the urethra, which is not shown down here. So the flow of urine from its production in the kidneys into a structure which is not really uh, visible here called the renal pelvis, which is basically kind of like a funnel-like structure that funnels the urine into the ureter. Then we go to the ureters and then to the bladder, out through the urethra and into uh, the toilet, right? So let's take a look at the bladder first. I think probably the best way to do this is to kind of start at the bottom and then work our way up. So here's the bladder. You can see the ureters on either side bringing us urine from either the right kidney or the left kidney. There is your left kidney there and there is your right kidney there. So uh, the wall of the bladder is made up of a type of smooth muscle. So you can kind of see the smooth muscle making up the wall of the bladder. This is called the detrusor muscle. Similar to cardiac muscle tissue, these smooth muscle fibers are connected to each other by gap junctions so that we can depolarize all of these cells in one fell swoop and get them to all contract and relax as one big functional unit. So since we're talking about smooth muscle cells, we are talking about a target of the autonomic nervous system, right? So uh, the smooth muscle of the detrusor is majorly under the control of the parasympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system. So when these parasympathetic post-ganglionic fibers release acetylcholine, don't forget, 
The parasympathetic uses acetylcholine, the sympathetic uses norepinephrine or epinephrine. So when the parasympathetic division is in action, your rest and relaxation, your rest and digest, uh, they're going to release acetylcholine onto the smooth muscle fibers here of the detrusor muscle, and that is going to stimulate the contraction of the detrusor muscle that will pressurize the urine that has filled up the urinary bladder, and we can then push that urine out through the urethra. So it is worth mentioning that uh, in cases of things like incontinence, many bladder control medications actually act to block these muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So if someone is having trouble controlling their bladder, meaning that their bladder is contracting without their ability to kind of regulate that, if we block the ability of the parasympathetic division to communicate with the detrusor muscle, we can help to kind of control the bladder in that regards. And then it's also worth mentioning that the detrusor muscle is under negative influence by sympathetic uh, motor neurons. So the sympathetic division is going to inhibit the detrusor muscle from contracting. So this is kind of a weird thing for me to say. In fact, if, if you don't mind me going on a little uh, a side story from when I was in college, uh, this is kind of funny. My uh, physiolo my human physiology teacher in college uh, was a woman. And uh, I say that because it, it, it was funny to hear this example come out of a woman's mouth. She, When we first talked about this, she used a man standing at a urinal as her kind of example of this. She said, okay, guys in the room, when you, when you go to a public restroom and you walk up to the urinal and you start urinating, you are under parasympathetic division if you're alone. But if someone like, say, walks up behind you and starts kind of looking over your shoulder, you're going to get real creeped out. You're going to find it kind of hard to continue urinating. Well, we can explain that due to the sympathetic stimulation. You get kind of uh, antsy a little bit when someone's peeking over your shoulder when you're trying to pee, right? So that's going to switch you over from parasympathetic to sympathetic. Parasympathetic helps you to urinate because it helps to stimulate that detrusor muscle. Sympathetic is going to make it harder. It inhibits the detrusor muscle and stops the urination process. So like I said, it was kind of weird and funny to hear that coming from a female teacher, especially since it's something that really only I think men can uh, relate to since we're the ones that have to stand at urinals and uh, risk having creepazoids uh, look over our shoulders. So. Uh, anyway, a uh, funny story, but that story does kind of help uh, remember the relationship between uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions on the detrusor muscle. Uh, so in addition to the detrusor muscle below here uh, surrounding the urethra, you can see we've got the prostate gland there if you are a man. Uh, in addition to that, we also have one extra layer of control over the urination process. We have a pair of sphincters that can open and close to regulate the passage of urine through the urethra. So the upper one here, which is right near the base of the detrusor muscle, uh, this is called the internal urethral sphincter, and it is also made of smooth muscle. Whereas the lower one down here, the external urethral sphincter, this one is made of skeletal muscle. So this is the one that you are actually able of, to voluntarily contract when you need to, for lack of a more... Uh, scientific term when you need to hold it in. You, you have to go, but you need to hold it in, right? So this is basically the way the urination process works from the perspective of the uh, bladder. When the bladder fills up, this is going to activate stretch receptors. So these are a type of mechanoreceptor that are located within the bladder. When the bladder fills up, it starts to expand and that's going to stretch some of those stretch receptors. So those are on sensory neurons, just like all the receptors that we've talked about throughout the semester. This is going to send an afferent signal into, a, into the spinal cord, up ascending tracks, and to the brainstem, particularly the pons. The pons is going to integrate a response that will send a parasympathetic efferent signal back down the spinal cord through descending nerves and to the detrusor muscle. So... Uh, when we talked about the parasympathetic stimulation of the bladder, I didn't mean it just happens willy-nilly. Parasympathetic stimulation of the bladder will happen when the bladder starts to expand and gets full. But like we said, 
sympathetic stimulation or your contraction of the external urethral sphincter can prevent this from happening. So, like we were saying, because of that skeletal muscle in the external sphincter, you do still have some voluntary control over urination to a point. This whole kind of homeostasis loop here is called the voiding reflex, whereas the sympathetic side of it is called the guarding reflex. So, uh, when the bladder is not full and therefore not stretched, there's no parasympathetic input, and instead you get sympathetic input, and like I said, that is called the guarding reflex. So, we keep the detrusor muscle from contracting when there is not a sufficient amount of urine in there to fill it up. So, that is called the guarding reflex. So, if we continue to work our way up from the bladder and up to the ureters, the ureters actually have something in common with uh, uh, some of the blood vessels that we talked about before. So, you can actually look here and see several different layers here. So, there is a lumen, so that's where that's kind of the hollow interior where you are going to find the blood if you're talking about blood vessels, but in this case, the lumen is going to be where the urine is. So you have this internal layer, which is made up of uh, endothelial cells. You have a middle layer of smooth muscle, and then you have an outer adventitia or external layer. So we've got three different layers here. Endothelia on the innermost, smooth muscle in the middle, and kind of this connection to the connective, uh, this kind of connective tissue connection to uh, the extracellular matrix on the outside. So be thinking about this. Which type of blood vessel that we've talked about does that kind of remind you of? Okay, so now this is where we're going to spend the vast majority of our time for this chapter. These are the kidneys, so let's go ahead and talk about exactly what they're doing. Now, if we crack open the kidneys like we are here with this uh, uh, cross-section here, we're going to notice something that we've actually seen in several other places. The kidneys, much like the adrenal glands, much like the ovaries, both of which we've talked about before, they consist of an outer cortex layer, so you can see this outer cortex layer out here, and then an inner medulla, uh, medulla layer on the inside. It's kind of a darker color there. So the cortex, as you'll notice, is very, very highly infiltrated with capillaries. So you can see all these little blood vessels coming in and out, the red being arterioles and the blue being venules. And then the renal medulla consists of somewhere between 8 and 15, it depends, somewhere between 8 and 15 renal pyramids. So these are these kind of triangular shaped uh, regions. And Everything that we've talked about here, both cortex and medulla, is going to be important, but specifically, the pyramids will funnel urine into these structures here called the renal calyces, which together make up a renal pelvis, which, like I was mentioning, tend to funnel urine once it is made into the ureter there. So each renal pyramid consists of several bundles of what we call nephrons. Now, a nephron is the functional unit of filtration in the kidneys. It is the functional part of the kidney that is going to focus on treating the blood and producing urine. Now, a nephron is not a cell. It is actually made, it's basically a bunch of tubes that are made up of cells. So try not to get confused by that. It is not one individual cell. It is actually not unlike uh, kind of blood vessels in the sense that it is capable of ca carrying and transporting fluid. So if you look at this picture right here, can you see all those different nephrons there? All I want you to take note of for the time being is the fact that for each one of these nephrons, you can see they start up here in the cortex and they end up way deep down here in the medulla, uh, kind of feeding into the renal calyx right there. Take note of the fact that Part of the nephron is in the cortex and part of it is in the medulla. That is going to be exquisitely important later on. So if we look at renal blood flow, obviously we need to get blood flowing into the kidneys if we are going to filter the blood. You can't filter what doesn't get there, right? Uh, so in a previous picture, we saw the renal artery, which branches off of the descending aorta. So when your left ventricle goes through systole and pumps out a stroke volume, a good portion of that is going to go descend down through the descending aorta and into the kidneys via the renal arteries. 
So you can see the renal arteries will start to simplify here. The renal artery will feed 2B filtered blood into the renal hilium, which is this area right here. And then the renal artery will eventually branch into what are called interlobar arteries, which will then branch into what are called afferent arterioles. So you kind of have to go way, way, way up here. Afferent arterioles are going to bring blood into individual nephrons. So the afferent arteriole will then form a capillary bed that is at the interface of the nephron, and this capillary bed is called a glomerulus. The glomerulus, which is like a capillary bed, but it's not actually a capillary bed because there is not a venule on the other side. There's actually another arteriole. So afferent arteriole brings uh, blood into the glomerulus, and then the efferent arteriole brings the blood out. And from there, we hit our capillary bed, which is called the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries are closely and intimately in contact with all the different parts of the nephron. You can see it there. And then once they kind of complete their circuit there, they branch off into venules. And then we start to drain into the renal vein, which is then eventually going to branch into the inferior vena cava to bring deoxygenated and filtered blood back to the right atrium. Okay, so like we were saying, blood that enters the nephron through the renal artery and then the afferent arterioles is going to move in at a very high pressure. We know that arteries and arterioles carry high pressure blood. This high pressure blood will enter into this capillary structure called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is encapsulated by a portion of the nephron which is called Bowman's capsule. So Bowman's capsule is this kind of... Uh, uh, if you do this with your hand and then you picture the glomerulus kind of being stuck in there, that's essentially what it looks like. So Bowman's capsule is very important because this is where our blood filtration is going to occur. This is the only place that filtration occurs. So this intimate relationship between the high pressure glomerular capillaries and Bowman's capsule will allow us to get a very high rate of blood filtration. Again, about 180 liters per day. So here's something for you to kind of think about. Why do you think the glomerular capillaries need to be maintained at such a high pressure? So think about that and particularly think about the direction that fluid needs to go here. So fluid needs to move from the blood in the glomerulus into the interior of Bowman's capsule so it can start circulating throughout the nephron. So given what we've talked about, the role that pressure plays into fluid movement, you might be thinking about why we need the glomerular capillaries to be maintained at a high pressure. So of all the different activities that the nephron does for us, we can break them down into three different categories. Filtration, we've already talked about. This is the removal of materials from the blood and we store them into a material called filtrate. We're not calling it urine just yet. We can't call the filtrate urine until it is passing down through this collecting duct and into the renal calyx for delivery to the bladder. Before that, from the time the blood is filtered to the time the final urine is produced, we call that urine filtrate instead. Number two is a process called reabsorption. What you're going to see is that the filtration process is kind of a shotgun approach. We basically fire off a whole bunch of rounds and basically because of that, we're gonna hit a whole bunch of targets that we don't really mean to. What I mean by that is that in the process of filtration, we are going to absorb from the bloodstream and into the filtrate far, far, far more things than we really need to. Perfect example of this. Filtration produces about 180 liters of filtrate a day. Well, obviously, that's a lot more than the there actually is blood in the body. So this is kind of what the whole reabsorption process is about. We take materials from the filtrate, mainly water, things that we want to put back into the blood, and we do so. 
And then finally, number three is the process of secretion. So this is kind of the final part, the final thing that has to occur before we can kind of call the filtrate urine. Now you might be saying, okay, well, we're just moving more stuff from the blood to the urine. How is that any different than filtration? Well, what you're going to see here is certain things, for whatever reason, either can't make it into the filtrate during the filtration process, either we don't get enough of it out of the blood and into the filtrate to be sufficient, so we have to get more of it out during secretion. Basically, this is just our final opportunity to get anything out of the blood and into the urine that we want to before we get it down to the bladder. So as we've already seen, filtration happens at the glomerulus Bowman's capsule uh, interface. Reabsorption and secretion are basically going to happen everywhere else. So if you look at the nephron here and you look at all the different places that are in intimate contact with those uh, 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 capillaries that we talked about before, these are all the different places because the capillaries are in such close contact excuse me, in such close contact with all the other portions of the nephron, we can easily reabsorb, secrete, reabsorb, secrete in those areas. And those areas are, if you start at the, uh, at, uh, the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule and then kind of wind your way, snake your way along, after Bowman's capsule, you're going to first hit the proximal convoluted tubule, then the loop of Henle, which is here called the loop of the nephron, we'll call it the loop of Henle, uh, the distal convoluted tubule here, and then finally the, uh, the, the, the collecting duct, which is basically going to be our pathway that takes us into the ureters. So here you can kind of see uh, the uh, balance between the filtration process and the reabsorption process. So as I was mentioning, we reabsorb about 180, or excuse me, we filter about 180 liters of water a day. That is way, way, way too much. So that's why we have to reabsorb somewhere between 178 and 179 of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any water left in our body. It all get uh, taken out of us and we'd be nothing but a shriveled mess at that point. So the difference there is you only end up ab ab with about one liter of water in your urine per day. Uh, proteins... Uh, there shouldn't really be a whole lot of protein making it out in the filtrate, and we'll talk about that later. Any that does will reabsorb it back, so there really should be no protein whatsoever in the urine. Uh, and then certain things, uh, we can permit some of them to make it out of the urine, but it's going to kind of depend on things like diet, what have you been eating, what have you been drinking to determine those sorts of things. Uh, glucose, there should be none in the urine, even though we do let quite a lot of it out through the filtrate. We reabsorb it all back so that there should be none of it in the urine. And there's several other examples that we could talk about here, but we will save that for another time. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we are going to walk ourselves through the entire function of the nephron from the time filtrate is produced. And since we are starting with the process of filtration, let's talk about Bowman's capsule and the glomerular capillaries. So if we go backwards here one more time, you will notice when we're talking about what is filtered, what makes it from the blood into the filtrate, we're looking at things like water, a very small amount of protein, salts, uh, glucose, lots of different things that can make it through the filtrate. So that's all we're really talking about here with Bowman's capsule. What can make it from the blood and into that initial 180 liters of filtrate? So the first thing to understand about the glomerular capillaries is like most other places in the body, they are fenestrated. So most capillaries in our body are fenestrated. By fenestrations, we mean these kind of Swiss cheese holes that means the capillaries are kind of leaky. Things can kind of leak back and forth. Cells are probably too big to make it through there, but most anything else, if it's small enough to make it through the little Swiss cheese holes, it probably will. So because the glomerular capillaries are fenestrated, mole small molecules like water, salts, sugars, amino acids, and things of that nature, those things are probably small enough to make it through these pores. So they should not be in any way restricted by the glomerular endothelia here. So we mentioned that most capillaries in the body are fenestrated, but glomerular capillaries take it to a whole nother level. These guys are about 200 times more permeable than most capillaries in the body. So that's pretty damn permeable, right? 
So if water, ions, and other small molecules are going to pass from the blood inside the glomerular capillaries and into the nephron tubules, there are three different barriers that have to be overcome. So basically the way to think about this, imagine some molecule in your urine that you want to pass out through, uh, some molecule in your blood that you want to pass out in the urine. If that molecule is going to make it into that initial filtrate, three different barriers that have to be overcome first. The first one we just got done discussing, the fenestrated endothelium of the capillary. This barrier is hardly a barrier at all. The only real thing that this thing is going to stop from making it into the urine is cells and very large proteins like antibodies. We mentioned that these glomerular capillaries are very, very leaky, so most anything else, water, salts, sugars, amino acids, and things like that, most anything else is just going to freely leave the glomerular capillary uh, to make it to our next barrier. The second barrier is called the basement membrane or basal lamina of the glomerular capillary. So this is the other half of the tunica intima of capillaries. So the tunica intima, as we've discussed, is made up of vascular endothelia and a basal lamina surrounding. So this basal lamina is a lot more restrictive than the fenestrations were. What this is going to stop is most plasma proteins from making it into the filtrate. Now, things like water and salts will continue past the basal lamina, but any proteins that moved through the fenestrations are going to get stopped by this kind of gel or clear-looking basal lamina that is on top of it. And then finally, the third and easily the most restrictive of the barriers, something that we can't actually see a picture of here until we get uh, another slide or two in, is called the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. So this picture on the right here doesn't really do it justice. It's not the sort of thing like if I kind of make a cup with my hand here and then kind of do this, that doesn't really do justice to what the interaction is like between the glomerular capillaries and Bowman's capsule here. Think of it more like Bowman's capsule is completely entrenched and completely squirming around those glomerular capillaries. So instead of thinking of it kind of like a cup that surrounds it, think of it like a whole layer of tissue that completely surrounds the glomerular capillaries. And I think you'll see what we mean here in a second. Yeah, so this picture is a lot better. So. Uh, Bowman's capsule is more like a big fleshy layer of tissue that is overlaid on top of the glomerular capillary. So you can kind of see that better there. So the visceral layer is made up of specialized cells called podocytes. These podocytes are kind of like the astrocytes that we talked about back in the nervous system. So they've got kind of these little arms that reach out. So these cells have these little arms that reach out and wrap around the capillaries and these arms, if you kind of picture two arms that kind of grab something, these arms have a little gap in between each arm. The little gap that I'm allowing here between my two fists, the gap in this case is called a slit diaphragm. And this is the very narrow and very thin space that is allowed for things to pass through. So if you look down here at the bottom, you can kind of see the little slits, the little filtration slits in between uh, the podocyte pedicels that we talked about on the previous slide, this is called the slit diaphragm. This is a very narrow space that is only there to permit very, very small molecules like water and salts and sugars and things of that nature from getting through. This final barrier is to make sure that nothing inappropriate makes it from the blood and into the initial filtrate. And then this electron micrograph I really like shows you all three barriers all together. So down here at the very bottom, you can see the blood plasma inside of the glomerular capillary. You can actually see a whole red blood cell down here at the bottom. Next here is the uh, endothelia of the uh, glomerular capillary. You can see one of the fenestrations there. On top of that, you can see the basement membrane, and then on top of that, you can see the podocyte pedicels that are kind of reaching their foot feet down, and then you can see the narrow slit diaphragms in between, that very narrow space that 
is permitting uh, very small molecules to get through. So if you start at the bottom here and picture some molecule that's going to make it all the way from the blood and into the filtrate, it has to go through the fenestration, through the basement membrane, through the slit diaphragm, and from there it is now inside of Bowman's capsule and inside the lumen of the uh, nephron. And it will then move on to the proximal tubule and then to all the other regions of the nephron. Uh, so we can talk about this in more detail when we start talking about urinalysis, but a good example of something that we had talked about other than, say, glucose, a good example of something that should not show up in healthy urine is proteins. So the difference between glucose and proteins is that glucose will make it into that initial filtrate, right? Proteins should not even make it into the filtrate. Proteins should not be in your urine. They should not be in your filtrate. So in healthy individuals, that basement membrane that we talked about, the basal lamina of the glomerular capillaries, and the slit diaphragms working together should prevent the passage of plasma proteins into the filtrate. I, I say urine here, I mean filtrate. So people who have either genetic defects in the genes that encode the proteins that make up the slit diaphragms or people who have kidney damage sometimes will have proteins leaking into their urine. If someone has a lot of protein in their urine, it usually means that there is damage to the kidneys and more specifically damage to the barriers of filtration at Bowman's capsule. So you can see a healthy situation over here in which all the proteins are contained within the blood plasma and then the filtrate on the outside and in Bowman's capsule, which has no protein whatsoever. Yeah, and like we said, Proteins, which are here in green, we want them to stay in the blood. We do not want them ending up here in Bowman's capsule. But other things like salts, water, and things of that nature, because of the high rate of glomerular filtration, we do expect those things to end up in the filtrate in Bowman's capsule. So a healthy individual will filter through small solutes like salts and glucose and things of that nature, but larger things like proteins and things of that nature will stay in the blood plasma because of the barriers that we just discussed. After the filtration process has finished, here in Bowman's capsule we have got our filtrate. It is mostly water and salts, and that stuff will then move on to the rest of the nephron for us to begin the reabsorption process. So I mentioned before, and it never ceases to amaze me, it's always surprising no matter how many times I hear it, the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, is about 180 liters per day, or about 7.5 liters per hour. So if you've got about 5 or 5.5 liters of blood in your whole body, that means that you are filtering 1.3 times your total blood volume every hour. That's insane. How can that be right? Well, as I was mentioning, the thing that we're really missing from that is the process of water reabsorption. Just because we lose a whole bunch of water to the filtration process does not mean that we don't get it immediately back in the reabsorption process. So, yes, it is true that we do lose a whole bunch of water to Bowman's capsule every hour, but most of that water is getting sent right back into the blood plasma via the reabsorption process in the other parts of the nephron, as we are going to see later. However, it is definitely worth thinking about the sorts of factors that might influence your glomerular filtration rate. What sorts of things could increase it? What sorts of things could decrease it? So I want you to think about this in anticipation of our next Collaborate meeting. So think about what we could do to either decrease or increase that glomerular filtration rate. And the hint I'm going to give you Think about blood flow into the glomerular capillary. So here's an afferent arterial there. What do we know that we can do to arterioles to change the flow of blood? So be thinking about that. So as we've seen before, not in chapter 14, that's a typo. So as we saw in chapter 20, uh, the best way to promote or restrict blood flow to a particular organ uh, in this case, we're talking about the kidneys, is to do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So that might kind of get you thinking about the answer to the prior problem. So if you're talking about getting your autonomic nervous system involved, whether you're talking about, uh, so if you're talking about vasodilation and vasoconstriction, you're obviously solely talking about the sympathetic branch. 
Uh, so sympathetic stimulation, depending on kind of what targets you're hitting, can either vasodilate or vasoconstrict those blood vessels, those afferent arterioles, and can maybe decrease your glomerular filtration rate just because there is less blood flowing into the kidneys. If there's less blood flowing through, we're not going to be able to make nearly as much filtrate. So this uh, baroreceptor reflex that we've looked at before, we can kind of look at it in a whole new light here. So how we've described this before in terms of maintaining our blood pressure, the main ways we can do this is through changing your cardiac output. So if your blood pressure is low, you can increase your heart rate to increase your cardiac output. You can increase the contractility of the heart to increase your stroke volume. You can increase total peripheral resistance through vasoconstriction of uh, systemic arterioles. But now we can see there's actually a fourth way. We can vasoconstrict afferent arterioles in the kidneys to decrease the amount of urine that is being produced and increase the blood volume. So that is just a fourth way now that we can talk about how the baroreceptor reflex can help to maintain our blood pressure. But in spite of this, in spite of various sympathetic effects, the glomerular filtration rate is usually going to be pretty constant, even in spite of little changes here and there to your blood pressure. And this is because of a function of, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a function of the smooth muscle in the afferent arterioles, which is called renal autoregulation. So basically, anytime the blood pressure changes, these uh, afferent arterioles are going to constrict and relax to make sure that the uh, GFR doesn't change too terribly much. So it is kind of, it's a nice thought exercise to think about how you might go about changing the GFR, but really because of this renal autoregulation, uh, uh, it's not really going to change too terribly much. So definitely two ways that urine volume can be changed uh, are either by changing the GFR through vasoconstriction and vasodilation that we talk about, or by talking about different types of uh, internal uh, signaling molecules or drugs that we happen to, happen to take, either one, which are called diuretics. So a lot of diuretics are vasodilating compounds that will increase your GFR, increase urine production, and therefore make you wanna go to the bathroom more. So not every diuretic necessarily works this way, but it is worth mentioning that a lot of common diuretics like nitric oxide, which is actually kind of down the line in how uh, caffeine works, a lot of these diuretics are actually vasodilators. And I'm not gonna hold you responsible for knowing uh, any really any type of diuretic, but if that's something that you happen to be interested in, now that we've talked about the process of glomerular filtration, it might be kind of worth your time to look into that if that's your sort of thing. So a uh, big conclusion here, in spite of us producing about 180 liters of filtrate every day, we're only going to excrete one, maybe two liters of it, depending on our fluid intake. So really 98 to 99% of filtrate water gets reabsorbed back into the blood. And then obviously the amount of urine that we actually excrete throughout the day as we've seen uh, throughout our lifetimes is dependent on your water intake. So if you expect to urinate one liter a day and you drink a whole bunch of water and then excrete a whole bunch more, you probably have a pretty good idea why. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and cut this video off here. We will start uh, part two here next. So to kind of orient you, get you ready for next time, so far we have talked about blood flow through afferent arterioles and into the glomerulus. We've talked about the association with Bowman's capsule, the three barriers to filtrate formation, and we finished off by actually talking about the filtrate itself. So at this point, we have formed in one day 180 liters of filtrate, and for the most part, that filtrate contains water, salts, sugars, and things of that nature. So when we pick it up next time, we are going to start talking about starting the reabsorption and secretion process. So the filtrate at this point basically has the same consistency as the blood plasma. It just doesn't have any of the formed elements. So the filtrate has 
uh, an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. It basically has the exact same composition of, as the blood plasma, just no uh, cells or anything of that nature. So if we really want to concentrate the urine, get it to be exactly what we want, we still have some work to do. So we'll pick up where we left off and we'll start talking about what the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct do to give us our final urine product. So I will go ahead and sign off for now. I will see you next time.